right, friends. Well, welcome back for another session of How to Read the Bible. Friends, we are on session five, which means there is just one more after this. We're so close. Uh, I hope that these last several classes have been helpful for you uh, and that they've empowered you to read and study the Bible on your own in a more accurate way, in a more faithful way, in a more consistent uh, way. And that actually leads to the tool that I want to introduce you to today. So the tool that I'm going to introduce you to is actually uh, kind of following up on a question that I have alluded to, a point that I've kind of not delved too far into, but I've touched on in these previous sessions, which is this. Uh, this tool is meant to be a response to this question, this question that I get all the time from folks both inside and outside the church, which goes something like this. Kyle, you know, these tools are great, these are helpful, they're helping me understand and better interpret the Bible, but what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to read? How am I supposed to read and interpret the passages that seem to be communicating something, that seem to be arguing for something, that seem to be condoning something that I feel runs very contradictory to the God that I have come to know and love? And so, Passages that seem to condone slavery or violence or misogyny, those passages, uh, what am I supposed to do with those? How am I supposed to read those? And friends, I do want to take some time on this topic because this is something that prevents people from uh, not only engaging in a relationship with the Bible, but this is something that keeps people away from the Christian faith altogether. I encounter people all the time who say, uh, one of the reasons why I can't go to church and I can't believe in the Christian God is because I don't know which God is actually the real one. There seems to be a couple of different gods, one that's merciful and compassionate and loving, and one that's violent and vengeful and a little bit manic. And so I can't, since I don't know which God is real, I can't trust that God. I can't give my life over to that God. And maybe you're listening today. And those have been uh, confusing confusions for you. Those have been things that have kind of been obstacles for you that have stifled and stopped uh, your ability to really relate and understand uh, the Bible and what it has to say. Because at the end of the day, uh, those questions are really, really valid and they're right to point out that all the tools that we've given, you, given to you up until this point, yeah, they're gonna help you sort of uncover and unearth uh, some details and facts about the you know, surroundings and the context of the Bible that you didn't know before. They're gonna help you better understand the message, but they're not gonna resolve the dilemma of what you're supposed to do when it seems like their message runs contradictory to the God that you believe in. And so, again, the tool for today is really meant to help uh, alleviate that a bit. And so the tool that I'm going to introduce you to today, not to sound <laughs> overly simplistic, uh, but the tool that I'm going to introduce you to is called the Jesus tool. The Jesus tool. It almost sounds like uh, the, the sort of proverbial answer that would always come up in Sunday school. It's the answer to every Sunday school question. Jesus! Jesus! Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm not going to explain what this means, but I really do feel like the Jesus tool uh, is one that uh, we have to keep on our tool belt and we have to deploy whenever we're trying to read and study the Bible on our own because it's going to be very, very instrumental in helping us sort of navigate, uh, particularly those passages uh, that are confusing, that are disorienting, that, that, that don't seem to align uh, with who God, the God is that we've come to know and love. Okay, so here's what I mean by the Jesus tool. There's a phrase, <clears throat> there's a phrase that occurs all over the Bible, uh, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. That phrase uh, is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's useful for rebuke and correction and teaching. This phrase shows up all over the Bible. But did you know? Uh, did you know? So it's fascinating because when you go to uh, many churches today, when you hear them use the phrase, the Word of God, oftentimes we just make a, we just sort of draw a direct line to the Bible. We think, oh, the Word of God is referring to the Bible. So when the Bible says the Word of God, it's kind of like referring to itself. But you know, that's actually not true. That's actually uh, not accurate. Did you know that the phrase, the Word of God, very rarely in the Bible is referring to any form of physical scriptures? Did you know that? Most times when you read uh, the phrase, the word of God, in both the Old Testament and New Testament, it's not referring to any physical scriptures. It's referring to times when God has spoken in the past audibly to someone, or uh, a time where God has spoken through a prophet or a leader or a priest or someone like that to the, to the group, to the community gathered there. 
And then when you get to the New Testament, you want to know the other meaning of the Word of God. The other times where it mentions the Word of God, it's not referring to physical scriptures. It's not referring to a time when God spoke. It's referring to a person. So in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, when it talks about the Word of God, it's talking about a person. It's talking about the person of Jesus. That the Word in the beginning was with God. The Word was God. And so that's a really interesting move by the author to say, and it's in, it's in caps, right? It's in caps. The, the, the Word in John chapter 1 is capitalized almost as if to say, of all the things that God has ever said, of all the things that God has ever done, of all the messages that you've ever heard that claimed to be of and from God, this is the one you got to listen to the most. This is the clearest cleanest revelation that humanity will have ever received up until this point as to who God is and what God is like. And it almost, uh, when you think of Jesus in that way, as this sort of capital W word, uh, it makes a ton of sense when we read what he says in John chapter 5. So what's so fascinating is that Jesus actually coaches us and teaches us how to use the Bible, how to read the Bible. And he does so kind of by way of his rebuke of the religious, pharisaic sort of type, the uberly uh, legalistic type Christians that he was, or followers that he was running into during the gospel. So in John chapter 5, he's interacting with these folks, these really churchy folks who, uh, they take their Bible, they take their scriptures really seriously. And he says in John chapter 5, verse 39, he says this. He says, you search the scriptures, thinking that in them you're going to find eternal life failing to understand, failing to realize that their job was to point to me. The job of the scriptures was ultimately to testify, to lead, to, to point, to prepare the way for me, the capital W word, the ultimate word, the final word on who God is, what God is like, and what messages God is about. And so friends, one of the things I'm hoping that you're beginning to see is that uh, Jesus is actually one of the most important tools uh, at all together when it comes to our reading and understanding of the Bible. When we read passages of scripture and they sound like Jesus, they, they smell like Jesus, they walk, talk like Jesus, then those seem to be words that we can hold to be true, we can be confident about. But if there's words, lowercase w words in scripture that seem to contradict something Jesus said or something Jesus believed in, then they're at least worth some more conversation. They're worth some questions and some interrogation, if you will. What I'm trying to get you to see, friends, is that Jesus actually can be the answer to so many of the questions, so many of the doubts, so many of the dilemmas that we run into when it comes to the Bible. Jesus can be uh, the, the, the sort of antidote to some of those because just take some of the examples, right? So uh, previously, uh, we would read passages in the Old Testament that say, for example, like in Deuteronomy, when it says that it is okay to stone a disobedient child. Well, so if that's true, if that's true, then we've got to figure something out. Because when Jesus comes along, Jesus disobeys his own parents and like runs away, like hangs out in the temple and worries his parents half to death. You remember this uh, in the very beginning of the Gospels? Uh, and also, uh, Jesus is, we see this picture in the Gospels where Jesus welcomes the children. The children were running away from their parents and running to him. And he was welcoming them and loving them and tending to them. Jesus lifted up children as those uh, who possess the type of faith we ought to be modeling. So when you look at those two pictures, when you look at those two scenes, you either have to go, okay, well, God thought one way and believed one way in the Old Testament and then kind of changed his mind when Jesus showed up. Either God changed from the Old Testament to the New or our understanding of God changed after Jesus showed up and added some further clarity for us. Think of the passages uh, where it, it deals with adulterous or um, uh, adulterous women or, or prostitutes for that matter. There's passages in Leviticus. I think Leviticus chapter 20 specifically, that chapter talks about how it was completely lawful and okay and right and righteous to when you find someone caught in adultery to take them out of town and execute them. And so what do we do 
when Jesus is presented with that exact situation, he's presented with that exact scenario. Remember, the leaders bring him and they throw the woman before Jesus. and They say, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, whoever is without sin can throw the first stone. What does Jesus do? He shows her compassion. So again, did, did God change? Or was it our understanding of God? change. One more, one more. There's passages in the Old Testament that say that if you break the Sabbath, or if you find someone who breaks the Sabbath, the Sabbath was supposed to be your day off, where you just rest, you don't work, you don't do anything. There's passages in the Old Testament that say that you ought to punish uh, people who break the Sabbath. And yet, in the Gospels, Jesus himself breaks the Sabbath. And he heals people. He feeds people on the Sabbath. So friends, I, what I'm trying to get you and I to see, what I'm trying to get you and I to see, is that um, if the options are either God used to be really you know, angry and vengeful in the Old Testament, and then in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God hired a PR manager that said, okay, we gotta kind of revise our public image, so we're just gonna shift entirely and be a completely different God for the New Testament. If, it's, if that's option one, or option two is, it was our understanding that changed. It was our picture of God that changed. It was our, uh, our, our understanding, our, our thought process, our knowledge of God and what God wanted from us that changed in light of Jesus. Those are our options. Friends, I'm always going to opt for the latter. I'm always going to opt for the latter. Friends, we need to think of Jesus uh, in this way. Jesus is kind of like the filter. Uh, he's the filter by which we send every single word through to see which ones align and look like him, sound like something he would say, and which ones don't. I love this. One of my colleagues, uh, Adam Hamilton, the pastor of the Church of the Resurrections, another Methodist church in Kansas City, he says this. He says, Jesus is kind of like the colander. Those of you who like to cook, Jesus is like the colander that kind of filters away the stuff you don't want, the stuff that is not essential, that's not necessary, so that you can keep and man maintain the stuff that is. One more analogy. It's, it, Jesus is kind of like the lens. He's the lens that we put on whenever we go to read and understand the scriptures. Uh, because ultimately, uh, he is the final word. He is the, 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 the end, uh, the, the period on the sentence, right? Uh, and as I close, friends, I just want to assure you that this is not something we made up. It's, again, this is us trying really hard as a church to live into the very type of posture uh, that Jesus tells us to adopt when we do go to the scriptures that uh, we ought to go to the scriptures. Yes, we ought to take them seriously. Yes, we ought to study them. Yes, are they going to improve and deepen our relationship with God? Yes, 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 yes. However, it's not in them we're going to find eternal life. Their job, the scriptures' job, is to point us to Jesus, to point us to him. And so if they're not doing that, if they're pointing a different direction, then those words are not of God. They're not from God. They may have been the author's best attempt, given their limited understanding, where they were living in history, what was going on in the culture that they were living in. They may have been doing their absolute best to interpret what God was trying to say to them. But what they wrote down, what eventually was made manifest in the book that we call the Bible today, may not have been accurate or may not have been the complete picture that we now have after Jesus today. And so friends, I, I think this is such a really, really important tool that I wanna make sure that you use and that you're, just to give you permission, you are allowed to use. And in doing so, I think it's gonna deepen and increase your trust and it's gonna help you navigate those passages of scripture that don't seem to align with a compassionate, a merciful, a faithful God. And the added bonus of this tool is that I do think it'll also improve uh, how other people outside of our ch church perceive our faith. Again, like I said earlier, there are so many individuals who won't even step foot inside of a church because of their complicated relationship with the Bible, with how 
the Bible just seems to be bipolar. Uh, the God in the Bible seems to see, be so bipolar. Uh, you know, one day is angry and violent, one day merciful, compassionate, and loving. What in the world are we supposed to do with that? I think when we begin to read the Bible and study the Bible through the lens of Jesus, then we'll begin to preach and talk about a God that looks more and more and more like Jesus. It's kind of like what Gandhi used to say. Gandhi used to say, I, I love y'all's Jesus. It's just your Christians that I don't really care for too much, right? Um, friends, I think that's the, that's the goal. That's the goal. At the end of the day, I think uh, if we we're forced to choose, we need to be people who uh, take Jesus more seriously than the Bible rather than the other way around. Now again, is the Bible important? Absolutely. Is it pivotal and, and foundational to our understanding of who God is and what God's like? Absolutely. But we have to continue to apply the filter, the colander of Jesus to it so that we can make sure that our beliefs, our thoughts, our actions are as closely aligned with the person Jesus. All right, giving you a lot to think about, a lot to chew on. Head over now to the application guide. We've got some good discussion questions and things for you and your small group to consider. And I look forward to seeing you back for the final session of How to Read the Bible next time.